see your screen. Can so you see my screen? Perfect. So the floor is yours whenever you want. Okay, so first of all, I mean, thank you very much for this invitation. I, I think the program for the summer school has been really impressive. Unfortunately, we could not meet live. But uh, yeah, this is what it is. So what I would like to tell you a little bit about is about, you know, the work we are doing at DTU about how we apply machine learning to advance optical measurement, but also optical communication systems. So basically in this talk, I will work on a lot of different topics. So I will see how much I can cover for an hour, but I also have another talk, which is scheduled for next week, uh, sorry, for tomorrow. And then I will go through it uh, if, if, if I'm over time. So basically, Technical University of Denmark, I don't know how many of you have been there, but uh, in general, I mean, if, you, if you plan to visit Denmark, come and visit us in spring or uh, summer because uh, Autumn and winter is horrible, the days are very short, but during the spring and summer, it's a very beautiful place. And Denmark consists of three islands. And I will just try to enable my PowerPoint. It consists of a Jutland, which is the main island, Finn, and then Zealand. And then on Zealand, we have Copenhagen, which is the capital, and then 18 kilometers of, uh, of, 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 of our capital, we have the DTU. And uh, this is our building. So I work at the Department of Photonics Engineering and basically our main core area is application of photonics to different communication technologies, sensing technologies, monitor technologies, and so on. And we have around 15 groups working in the field of the photonics. And if you look at the rankings, I mean, I don't know, one can think a lot of things about these rankings, but I think we are quite well, well situated at least for some of the rankings here. And the group I come from is called Machine Learning in Photonic Systems. And uh, our topic is actually how to apply machine learning to advance photonic systems in general. And basically I'm the group leader and then we have, a, we have four senior staffs and then the rest of the group is basically PhD students. And what we have, we have basically a lot of different nationalities and uh, we are still have some open positions if we would like to, to work on this exciting topic. So our goal is actually to introduce intelligence in photonic systems. So these are some of the topics that we are working on, at least the topics where we have shown that machine learning has most success in it. And one of the topics that, that we've been working quite a lot is machine learning enabled ultra wide and amplifier design. Basically how to use machine learning to design an arbitrary shaped amplifiers, which can, where you can actually generate the, 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 the game profile in a controlled way. And this is an upcoming topic and uh, a lot of collaboration we have with Politecnico and Peterino in Verniera and also the Aston University. A lot of work together with the group of uh, Professor Sergei Turitsin. And then we also have work on unifying framework for lasers and frequency comp noise characterization. Because even though lasers have been with us for a long time, I mean, there is still a framework which is missing on how to properly characterize noise in, in lasers and frequency comps. And what we believe that we have developed at DTU is actually a unifying framework where we have a machine learning framework for characterizations of lasers and frequency combs. Basically, you have one device that can provide you of noise characterization for the lasers and frequency combs. And I will come into more details about this in a while. And this is a joint topic we have with uh, Professor John Bauer's group at UCSB in Venera Chambers and Menlo system. And Menlo system, that's one of the leaders in, in frequency combs. And basically we'll be using some of our methods actually to characterize their frequency comps. And then we have a project on how to actually design communication schemes or complex channels by using machine learning. Because for example, if you want to transmit data over a fiber optic channel, I mean, we still don't know, I mean, what is the optimal, let's say pulse shape or constellation shape. But in this case, we can use machine learning actually to learn it from the data. And we have a topic working on how to use actually optical technologies to accelerate the AI. That's similar to the previous talk by by Dimitris. And then we also have a lot of, we have started a lot of collaboration basically with our sister department at DTU Physics on how to apply machine learning for a quantum phase tracking and a quantum communication and how to have this very highly sensitive fiber-based sensing system using machine learning. Basically a sensing system that can operate as close as possible to a quantum limit. And for these topics, we have a very close collaboration with NKT, which are the providers of very narrow line with lasers and also with the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen and also with Max Planck Institute for Science and Light. 
So basically, I mean, the goal of, of our group is to provide intelligence in photonic systems. And as we have written in this optics and photonics news feature article, I mean, we believe that in a not too distant future advances in machine learning will spur a new generation of optical communication system and a measurement system systems. Because we really believe that actually that machine learning could be very useful. I mean, for some certain type of measurement and optical communication systems, basically, we could in, in one way or another redefine the way we transmit the data over the fiber. And the work I'm going to present, well, I mean, it's been, we've been working on this topic since 2012 and it's, you know, I would like to thank all the collaborators which come from different places, but it's, it's, a, it's a still an ongoing work and we are very much interested in, you know, in starting a new topics and expanding and, 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 and these collaborations. So after this talk, if you have some good ideas on how we could do, so do some work together, please do not hesitate to contact me. So now going a little bit more into the details. So this is the outline of my talk. First, I will tell you a little bit about machine learning in physical sciences, because machine learning current as it is, it's a, it's a very hot topic, but there is well, one also needs to be a little bit careful, I mean, about this buzzword of machine learning, because people are trying to apply it almost anywhere. And and this is very normal when there is a new topic. I mean, a lot of people jump into it. And the, the question what we need to see whether it, can we really use machine learning and for what can we use machine learning? I mean, I mean, even though if it's a very fashionable to use machine learning, maybe you should not use it for everything. I mean, so one needs to be, you know, very careful in what, at which problems we throw machine learning. And also, especially in physical sciences, because the, 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 a lot of the things in physical science is very well established. So if we really want to be fair, and say, well, this is where machine learning has an edge. We really need to do a rigorous comparison to all of the existing methods. And for example, that I will I will show you actually how we, for example, could use machine learning and where machine learning has an, an edge, for example, when we want to design Raman amplifiers and we also want to characterize conks. And I will end up this talk with a conclusion and outlook I mean, for what's next, because I think this is this is a new topic and there is a lot of research problems that, may, that can be tackled by, by using this, this, this new set of tools. So if you look at the, some of the recent advances and success stories of machine learning, I would say that my, my favorite one is, was, was done by Australian group back to 2016, where they used AI to learn and recreate a Nobel Prize winning experiment. And the thing with this experiment is because, you have, I mean, well, there are a lot of parameters to optimize. So the idea of this experiment is to generate this Bose-Einstein condensate. And, you know, there are a lot of nitty gritty things that need to be optimized. And instead of, you know, taking a human being, you know, a couple of days to optimize it, if you automatize everything and you, you let a machine lear a learning algorithm do optimization, you can do this optimization in a couple of hours. And this is exactly a very good application of machine learning for this very complex of the online optimizations. And this is really why it has an edge, as I will also show you later on. So this is a very good example of something. Well, I mean, it's, it's not because we are reinventing things. We are just using machine learning as a tool or as a key enabling technologies to realize a certain task. And similarly, I mean, within the last couple of years, there has been a lot of work on machine learning. And I think, you know, I was just trying to hear to, to cherry pick some of the, my favorite one, my favorite ones. And I think last year in optics and photonics news, there was a, this report on how machine learning can be used to, to, to tame X-ray beam instability. So basically you use a neural network to approve the stability of the X-ray beams. And I thought that application of machine learning was very cool. And then also in nature physics, I mean, there was a, a cover article about the power of machine learning and how machine learning can be used actually to advance the fundamental science in, in, in physics. And also we wrote a couple of years ago, I mean, in nature photonics about how machine learning can be used to advance Photonics and photonics communication and measurement systems in general. So in this, in 2000, it was, it was really at the beginning of this field, and there were not so many wor groups working on it. But now I think this field, this field is exploding, which is a good thing, which shows them I mean, that people are really interested to, to explore it. And in, if you look at the field of optical communication, I mean, I'm, applying machine learning to advanced optical communication is at least a very you know, it, 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 it has a lot of, it has received a lot of attention. And last year at OFC, there was actually a symposium. I mean, OFC is our largest conference. And since they, they dedicated actually a symposium to it, so that means that, you know, they really think that the, that the topic has some, some future. So the, the topic was the role of machine learning for the next generation of optical communication systems and networks. And if you look for this symposium, there's a collection of very nice papers here describing the fields, I mean, and how we can use machine learning to advance 
optical communication systems starting from the components, going, going through the systems, and then also at the network level. And likewise, I mean, IPC conference, I mean, this is more a photonics oriented conference. They organized uh, a symposium last year. Unfortunately, the conference was held online on the application of, of machine learning for the broad field of, of photonics. And also, I mean, if you look at him, there is a really nice collection of papers there. I think there is a, okay, somebody cannot hear me. But we can. Okay. Yeah, okay, then I continue. And then I think there is a, we have this, uh, there is a call for the Journal of Selected Topics in Quantum Electronics and Machine Learning in Photonic Communication Systems and the Measurement Systems. And the deadline is October 1st. So if you have something nice, I mean, please do consider it because I think this journal is a quite a nice journal. And I think in, in this topic, we are trying to, to, to have at least a, a bunch of papers on which are, which, which are you know, looking at the, at the applications of machine learning. Okay, let me just go to the next slide. Okay, so if you look at the state of the art, I mean, I just compared this to the to, to 2017 paper. And I think there has been a lot of compare, new topics coming up compared to what, what is in this chart. I think some of the new topics, okay, I haven't updated for, for year 2021, but for 2020, I mean, there was a lot of focus on photonic reservoir computing, optical amplifier, laser design, end-to-end -end learning, backpropagation learning, network optimization, I mean, and also photonic component design. So there is a lot of new topics coming up and people are realizing there are more and more problems at which we can throw machine learning. But the thing that really remains to be answered is, 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 will machine learning really be a game changer? I mean, will it really give us a significant benefit compared to the methods, well-established methods that we already have? And I think this is you know, still too early to, 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 to be answered. And I think that's a lot more research should be done before we can answer this question. But at least I think it's, it's a very good way to attract some very good students because I mean, the, the topic is gaining a lot of popularity and, and, you know, and, and once you have critical mass, I mean, I think you can you know, develop the, this, this topic in many different directions. So at least my personal opinion where I see that the, some of the problems that could benefit from the machine learning is for example, still com communication or nonlinear fiber optic channel. And not just the nonlinear fiber optic channel, but the free space channel or some very complex channels where, for example, we don't know the capacity of the channel or where we don't know actually the optimum receiver architectures for the channel. And as a matter of fact, I mean, for the fiber optic channel, we still don't know what is the optimum modulation and the pulse shape because we have this very complex interaction between the nonlinearities and the noise. And in this case, it really makes sense to say, well, can machine learning give us an answer? I mean, can we somehow, you know, deduct the optimal pulse shapes or the constellation shapes from the data by, by employing machine learning techniques. And then if we look at the, the, the current topics of the, in the optical communication, there is a really lot of focus on amplifiers for multiband wavelength systems and also for the SDM system, where SDM stands for spatial division multiplex systems. And I mean, the Raman is gaining a lot of interest there because basically with the Raman amplifier, you can provide gain at almost any wavelength, but then probably with the gamma Raman amplifier is how do you design a Raman amplifier because you have a very complex relationship between the pumps and the gain. So in this case, we throw machine learning at this control problem of how actually to optimize the, the, the pumps frequencies and, and, and the powers for a certain gain profiles. And then this can also be expanded to, well, I mean, how can we use, for example, machine learning to, 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 to minimize the mode dependent and coupling loss for the SDM amplifiers? And that's a very nice topic because in that case, you will have some free parameters of your pump lasers to be adjusted. So, so in those systems, you would like to minimize this. And then also there is a lot of application of machine learning for the inverse system design. So basically you are given the the, the, the desired response of your system and you would like to go back and see what are the parameters that will give you this type of response. For example, you know, given the laser bandwidth and the noise properties, let's find the physical parameters of the laser structure that will result in such a, such a behavior of the laser. Or given the modulator bandwidth, what are the physical parameters? And this topic, there is a lot of work going on, I mean, how to use machine learning to design, to, to design the optical photonic components. And this is called as inverse system design. But again, if you start, I mean, looking at topology optimization and the work that has been done there, I mean, there is, they've also considered a lot of this inverse system design. So from my point of view, what is missing is, you know, is a really fair comparison between this standard 
tools for doing the adverse system design, for example, that one that originated from this topology optimization community and the machine learning approach. Okay, and then we have noise characterization of lasers and frequency comps. Well, I mean, what we would like to do is we would like to, lay, to design lasers and frequency comps that operate at the quantum limit. So basically that their amplitude noise and phase noise is quantum limited. So the first thing one needs to do is actually, you need to have a very, very sensitive way of measuring the amplitude and the phase noise. And once you have measured the amplitude and phase noise, you basically need to build this noise correlation matrices from which you extract those microscopic comb parameters. And from these parameters, you can say, well, how can I actually use these comb parameters to obtain the structure of my laser or the frequency comb that will give me a quantum limited performance? So of course, I mean, the topics I've listed here, I mean, they are just, you know, like my personal opinion where we can use machine learning, but I'm sure there are many, many other things where, you know, machine learning could be useful. Go going to the next slide. But before we start running machine learning at different polarons, we need to see where does machine learning excel? And in, in this figure, I've tried to actually illustrate where I believe machine learning will excel. And that's, for example, if you want to learn the complex mapping. So let's say that we have our system that is described with this function f, and this is, and the relationship between the output and the input of the system is very complex. And basically we cannot de deduct it from the experimental data. Let's say we have, we, we, have, we have made an experiment where we excite our system with some input x, and then we measure the output y. And we actually would like to learn the relationship between an X, Y, Y. And in this case, actually it makes sense actually to use a machine learning model actually to learn the relationship between X and Y. And there are many approaches actually of learning this in the mapping. I mean, and, and basically if you look at the old theory, it, it corresponds to some kind of a basis function expansion. But it, it turns out actually that, that learning this mapping using neural networks is very useful because those models are very flexible models. So, that, so the neural networks are one way of learning this mapping. I mean, there are many other ways of learning it, but I mean, the advantage of using deep neural networks is basically that, that you can actually have very flexible models that are relatively easy to train. And the next example is actually, is learning this inverse mapping. Basically, we are, given a, we are given an output of the system and we would like to determine what kind of inputs will give us the certain outputs. Basically, we would like to learn the inverse of the system. And in that case, what we can also do is actually, I mean, we can perform a supervised learning where we actually excite our system with X and record Y. And then offline, we try to learn the relationship between Y and X. And these are all the regression problems. And you know, once you want to throw machine learning at a regression performance, you're always working in a suboptimal way. And that's why machine learning really excels when, you want, when, you, when you're using machine learning for a classification task. Like for example, here to learn the decision rules of complex mapping. So basically we have an input to our system and then we would like to determine the probability of output being one or zero. And the reason why this classifier can be like a map classifier is because you can take the maximum of the two outputs. So typically you have two outputs. One that gives you one and then one that gives you zero. And then you try to take the one that gives you the maximum value. So when we use machine learning for classification, I mean, it's, it's much, we introduce much less error than, for example, when we are using it for aggression. And this is something that, you know, that it, one needs to really go into the details to realize this. But always, if you want to really, you know, see where machine learning excels, that's for these classification problems. And then the task is here actually, is to use neural networks to represent these mappings, these complex mappings, and then use some kind of algorithm to up those, the, those weights of the neural network. So for example, why does it make sense to use machine learning in inverse system learning? So let's, let's look at this problem statement here. So if I look here, I have a problem statement where I have a physical, I have somebody saying something on the chat. Ah, okay. So basically I have a physical system here, which is described by a, some kind of a transfer function. I mean, it can be also a nonlinear function or a, some kind of nonlinear differential equations. I have an input to my system and then I have an output to my system. And now the objective is actually to determine the input parameter such that this y corresponds to some kind of a target variable. So basically, I mean, what I can do in a classical way, I can form an error between my y and between my target variable, which I denote e. And then in a the classical optimization techniques, I will actually 
use a gradient descent framework actually to compute my x. But what happens actually if this physical system is non-differentiable or, or if it's so complex that I cannot take derivatives through it? <coughs> or in another way, if this is actually an experimental setup where I have some inputs to my experimental setup and then I record some outputs and I would like my outputs to give me some certain target values. Then I cannot use these gradient-based methods. I can do some approximations to it, but that's not, I mean, I will be introducing some error. So instead what we can do actually, we can learn, we can try to learn the mapping between the output and the input. So basically what I can do here is I can excite my physical system with different axes and then I can record Y. And in that way, I can actually generate a data set. So it's, it, and then for this type of a supervised learning, I try to you learn the mapping between my output and the input. And to learn this mapping, I use this, let's say I'm in neural network structure, where I need to update my weights of the neural network that will give me the mapping between Y and X. And the advantage of this is, once I've learned the mapping between the output and input, then I can present an arbitrary target output to my system and then I will immediately get my inputs. So I don't have to rerun my optimization. So for, I mean, and this is extremely fast because once I've learned this inverse mapping, I can just present my target output and I will immediately get the input parameters that will result in this target outputs. Now, what I can also do is actually, I can learn the mapping between X and Y with a neural network. So I can try to, re to represent this physical system using a neural network. And the advantage here is that all of a sudden my system becomes differentiable because neural network is nothing else than a bunch of matrix of the, of, uh, multiplications with a, with a nonlinear function on top of it. And then I can form some kind of an autoencoder where I use this inverse system. So I basically I say, well, this is my target value. What should my inputs be X? So I propagate my target value through the inverse neural network. I get the X's which my inputs and then I propagate this access through my forward model, which represents the physical systems. And then I look at this target value here. And then I can even formulate an error between a T prime and a T. And then I can actually use a gradient descent to actually update this, these input parameters here. And I can actually fully employ my gradient descent because I can actually take the derivative through my neural network. So in this way, I mean, we've been using this type of a system to design multi-band programmable Raman gain amplifiers. So basically in this, in this case, I mean, machine learning, give, learning gives you a big advantage if you can actually, in learning the inverse system between the output and the input and also learning the forward system because you can use it for the optimization. Okay. Now, I mean, we can also use machine learning or neural networks actually to learn to communicate over complex channels. So in this case, the goal is actually, I have some bits I would like to transmit. I have my optical fiber, which is described by, let's say, a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And then I would like to have output bits. And the goal is to have an output bits as similar as the input bits. Well, if I, if I look at, you know, at the classical communication system, then I know that I need to do upsampling, I need to do mapping, I need to do pulse shaping. And at the receiver, I need to do match filtering, I need to do downsampling and demapping. But I can say, well, I can use a neural network to represent all these building blocks. So in this case, I mean, neural network represents the entire transmitter. It, it represents both the mapper and the pulse shaper. And likewise, my, uh, my output neural network represents the, it can also represent the equalizer and the demapper. So then I just start throwing data on this system. And I basically use, I basically use a, I need, in this case, I need to use a gradient-free method of updating the, the weights of the neural network to do this, to, to minimize the error. So this is the principle of how to actually use machine learning to learn to communicate over complex channels. And it doesn't have to be an optical fiber channel. This can also be any other complex channel for which we don't have analytical solutions. And the good thing is actually I can do all this online. Basically, I can I can run my DSP, uh, basically in terms of arbitrary waveform generator. I mean, I generate my bits. I apply my bits to a modulator. I send it through the fiber. I use my sampling scope to record the data and then I run it to my DSP. And then the DSP gives actually feedback how to optimize those weights. 
So one may say that we are re reinventing the way we send the data, but I would say, I mean, we are trying to, you know, somehow to, to, to optimize the way we, we, we send the data. And also this can be augmented. I mean, this is a very generalized picture where we use, you know, a deep neural network to, to replace the mapper and the, and, the, and, and the pulse shaper. But you can also say, well, we know what the pulse shaper should look like. We just want to design the mapper. The trick becomes here actually how to optimize those weights of the neural network because we cannot take the derivative to the optical fiber, especially for example, if we have like, if we have like SDM systems or some more complex systems. So again, I mean, a lot of research needs to be done. How do we actually train neural networks where we don't, where we are not allowed to take the gradient? So it's a kind of a gradient free optimization of neural networks. And actually within a EU project of Mentor, which uh, Professor Sergei Ritsin is leading, we're actually looking for people, I mean, who will help us actually design these novel schemes for, 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 for updating neural networks using these gradient free approaches. So if you're interested, we still have a position or two open within this topic. Okay. And then for frequency comps, I mean, and this is a little bit, I mean, we come from a side on this topic because I mean, the community of optical frequency comps and laser characterization is somehow, you know, it's very much, it's, it's disconnected from the optical communication community. But what we have done here is actually we have, we have seen what has really accelerated the development of optical communication. And that's basically coherent detection and the DSP. So the coherent detection has allowed us to actually have a linear detection of the optical field. And this has opened up for enormous opportunity to use optimum receivers in the DSP. And in this P, we can allow, you know, we can, we can design very complex systems. So this is the same approach we are using for a characterization of frequency combs. What we do is we pick the combs we want to investigate with the local oscillator comb, and then we do everything in the signal processing. What we do is actually, then we actually have a, a, a framework, like a machine learning framework for tracking of the amplitude and the phase noise of the frequency combs. And once you have this, I mean, you have full information of your comb noise properties, because in that case, you can do, you can build these correlation matrices and these correlation matrices have all the necessary information. So this is the approach here. I mean, how actually to, it, it's in machine learning gives you actual access to, I mean, these hidden noise properties of your combs here. And I mean, we have started working on this topic, but I think there are a lot of things to be done here because what we are using as a models for phase and amplitude noise, it's a very simplistic models. And I think there is a lot of room for, for improvement there. So these were some of the positive things of using machine learning, but there are also a lot of challenges to be addressed. I mean, our field is very much focused on experimental demonstrations. And, you know, people have, you know, spent, you know, a lot of time actually demonstrating the benefits of machine learning in, in, on experimental data. And that's ideally the way we should go. But then it becomes very tricky because there is a lot of noise in experimental setups. I mean, the noise is non Gaussian and there's a lot of drifts. So basically, I mean, this is what really makes it challenging actually to demonstrate these benefits experimentally. And, and you, I mean, there's been a lot of work on, on machine learning for, you know, on the synthetic data and or simulated data, but still it's, 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 neat, you know, it's not the same because many of those experimental things, I mean, it's very ch hard to model. So I think a lot of effort and push needs to be done in automatizing experimental setups for a stable training data acquisitions. You know, how do we, you know, prepare these very nice data sets? You know, how do we stabilize this, this, uh, this setups? Because for example, if you have a setup and there is a temperature drift, I mean, then your machine learning model, we also just take this temperature drift into account and that's like an artifact. So that's, you know, it should be somehow avoided. And then one big topic actually is once you want to do training on, of, you know, optical communication systems online, then you need to use, you know, gradient free optimization methods. And then a lot of the frameworks, I mean, which is out there like the TensorFlow or PyTorch, I mean, you cannot use it because they all use backpropagation. So if we really want to see the advantages of using machine learning, I think our community needs to focus on, you know, these gradient free optimization methods. And this is very challenging experimental environment because, you know, you always have, you know, when you send the data until you record it and you process, you still have some delays. I mean, that's, it, and it, it's very hard to make it work. And also what we need is more people working in this field because we need somebody who has a deep understanding of statistics, linear algebra, optimization, but also in the physics and also experimental set of debugging, not to fall into this pit, pitfall. So it's, I think it, it's, 
it's a bit of a, I would say, an important slide to, to push the field in the, in the, in the right, right direction. So now I still have half an hour left. So I will go into the more details of, uh, of how we are using actually machine learning for, uh, for design of our Raman amplifiers. And this is an ongoing topic where we have a very close collaboration with Aston University and Polytechnical Veterino. And if you're interested in some of the publications, I'm, I've listed some of the, our last publications here. And I think, you know, the, we also have some coming up on, on, on using machine learning to characterize a noise figure. But I think these five two are quite representative of, of the work I'm going to present here. So what is the problem here? Well, if you look at the field of optical communication, I think we are done with the C-band. I mean, I think C-band has been optimized as much as we can. And there is, a, there is still room for improvement in a C-band, but I think it, it, it's very minor. On the other hand, if you look at the growth of the global IP traffic in bytes per month and as a function of year, I mean, still there is a really, you know, big need because the, for, for very high capacity of your communication system, because this global IP traffic, it keeps on, on really on growing. So I would say I'm, our field is very important if, if, when we look at these future data projections. So the question is, I mean, how are we going to satisfy these future data rate demands? Well, I mean, I think it's always very good to do, go back to the basics. So if you look at the here, at a channel capacity formula in terms of bits per serve per hertz, we have that the capacity divided by the bandwidth equals with m, which is number of spatial path times log one plus SNR. And here I have just expressed the SNR as a EB, which is the energy per bit divided by the noise spectral density. So how many parameters we can tune here? Well, we can, we can tune the SNR. If we choose M equals one and try to tune the SNR, well, I mean, we, we, we still have, you know, an increase in our channel capacity, but it's very limited. We really need to push. And then the problem is as we start to increase the power, I mean, we, we start <laughs> seeing the effects of, uh, of a fiber nonlinearity. And it's an important topic, of course, but it's, you know, those huge gains in a channel capacity will not give you by, by pushing the SNR. What, what really makes a difference is by having, you know, more spatial paths. And that's actually exactly what WDM is. So if we open up for a more spatial path, you see as when you move from one to three, and we have a huge gains in a capacity for a specific SNR. And this is actually, you know, what, what the field is heading to is to actually explore the communication beyond the C-band because this will give us this spatial dimensionality if we open up for other bands. So what we are interested in is, is in ultra wideband optical communication systems. And if you look at the C band, I mean, there are so many other bands. I mean, okay, C band has the lowest loss, but L band, E band, O band, and S band, I mean, they can, you know, if you can, if you can amplify more equally, I mean, you can send the data also, you know, on these wave frequencies. The question is, is here, I mean, how do you design the optical amplification schemes? Because what has revolutionized optical communication system is the invention of the EDFA and also the invention of the coherent dash to, together with the DSP. We know more or less how to do the ESP for these bands, but we really don't have an amplifier that can cover all these bands. Because if you look at the C band, I mean, I mean, in C band, we are using EDFA. I mean, we're using this dope fiber amplifier. And in L band, I mean, you also have L band EDFA, but then you need to actually split the signal. So it's not as, as, as you know, as, as efficient as if you have one amplifier that could amplify both C and L band. On the other hand, there have been recent demonstrations on, you know, EDFA and provided with tulium dough fiber amplifier for covering S band and C band. And some other solutions have been, okay, you can, we can use abysmal dope fiber amplifiers. I mean, to cover E band, and there has been, of course, I mean, there is a lot of work actually now on SOA because SOA had to have a broadband. The problem with SOA is the nonlinearity and the noise figure. But again, I mean, there is optical parametric amplifier, but in general, I mean, I think, I don't think we have a solution that can cover all these five bands. And I think there is a lot of open research questions there, I mean, how to design amplifiers that can cover, I mean, all five bands. And the advantage of Raman amplifiers is actually that you can have a very flexible gain providing, I mean, depending on where you put your pumps. So Raman amplifier, I mean, they, they can provide you gains in almost any of the bands here, provided you can properly adjust the pump powers and the wavelengths. And that's why there is a renewed interest in the Raman amplifiers. But the Raman amplifier is also very efficient because you, mean, you can have these arbitrary gains, as I will show you here. So basically, I mean, 
if you want to design an ultra wideband amplifier, we have several degrees of freedom, and that's the Raman pumps, where we have the wavelengths and the powers and the number of pumps. So we have the incoming signal. We can still use the transmission fiber, but the question is, I mean, how to adjust those pump powers and the wavelengths and also the number of pumps. So if this is our, let's say, I mean, a target gain for L, C, and S band. Basically, we can, if we pick one pump, I mean, then we know 15 hertz below, we will have this Raman gain here. So this is with one pump. So typically one pump is not enough. We can have several pumps, but then once this gain profiles from the pump powers combined, we have some kind of, you know, spectra that it's not very close to our target spectra. And this is because we haven't done a proper adjustment of the pump powers and the wavelengths. And the reason is because it's very complex. I mean, this is the, these are the equations describing the propagation of the signal and the pumps. And there are a lot of parameters to be do, done there. So basically what we can do is we can try to adjust pump powers and waves until arrive to the desired solution. But how to do this effectively? I mean, this is the thing. I mean, you can do this manually, but once you start having, you know, many pump powers and waves, then it becomes very challenging. And, and actually this is an old problem. And people have typically used these genetic algorithms, you know, to, because in this case, I mean, it's hard to take the derivative through the Raman solver, even though actually now if you implement everything in a PyTorch, PyTorch can actually take you the derivative. But once you want to do this optimization online, I mean, then you're stuck, you cannot take the derivative. So what do you do in that case, if you have like an experimental setup? And what we would like to do is, I mean, we also have like to have a very short Conversion stamps, and we will. We also don't want to restart optimization every time we have a new target profile, because maybe we have optimized our pump powers and wavelengths for an old profile. But what happens if we have a new target? I mean, how do we actually do this optimization here? And basically, what we can do in this case, we can use multi-layer neural networks to learn the mappings. And in this case, I mean, this is just the forward mapping. So this is the forward mapping between the pump powers and the wavelengths and the gain spectrum. And the idea is to use this multi-layer neural network because this is a very flexible model to learn this forward mapping. And in the neural network, we have these connections. I mean, these are actually our linear, linear weights. I mean, so this X3 will be multiplied with the, with the weight W and then it will be taken to this nonlinear function. But once we have learned this mapping, I mean, then basically, and, and we learn this mapping because what we can do is we can generate the data set. And then for a new input, we would like to predict our gain spectra. So actually, I mean, optimizing this neural networks is not just a optimization task, it's more of a generalization task. How to make neural networks perform generalization in the best possible way? Because, I mean, you can. If you have your training data, I mean, you, may, you need to really avoid that you're overfitting. So basically that you are designing your neural network for this specific training data. You need to, you need to try to extract the, as general model as possible from your training data. But since we can also, since we can learn the forward mapping between the pump powers and the gain spectrum, we can also see, can we learn actually the inverse mapping between the gain spectrum and the pump powers? And once we have learned this inverse mapping, this allows for designing arbitrary gain profiles. Or actually we can both combine the, the forward model with the with, with inverse model and then do the final optimization. I will come to this later on. But this is basically the, let, let's look at this problem statement. Here we have a problem statement that we have a, our signal, I mean, which is populated in C band. I mean, this is represented by an ideal frequency comp. And then we would like to actually design a Raman amplifier such that we have equal amplification for all the channels. So we actually like to design a Raman amplifier for a flat gain profile. And in this case, we use two pumps and we have the wavelengths and the pump powers to adjust here. So what we do here is actually, once we learn the mapping between the, between the gains and the power prof with the pump powers and the wavelengths, then we just present to our neural network the gain profiles, and then we will automatically obtain the pump powers and the wavelength. And then what we do this, we actually apply them to this Raman amplifier, and then we actually measure how does our gain profile look like. So basically what we present to our this inverse neural network is a flat power profile, and then our ne inverse neural network gives us pump powers and the wavelengths, and then we apply this and do the benchmark. As you can see here, I mean, 
the difference between the predicted gain profile predicted by a Raman amplifier using the pump powers obtained through the inverse system design and the target one is, is quite quite nice. So in this case, we can we can we have actually learned the inverse model of the Raman amplifier between the gain profiles and the pump powers to give us specific allocation of the pump powers and the wavelengths for the flat profile design. And in my point of view, I mean, the biggest advantage actually of Raman amplifiers actually can give you an arbitrary gain profiles. And this is really important for the energy efficiency of the future optical communication system, because typically you will have an EDFA and then you will have some kind of flattening filter to flatten the comb. But in this case, you can actually use a Raman profile to design inverse gain profile of your ripple of your incoming signal. So you can use it for an equalization. And this has a really a lot of unexplored opportunities for actually for equalizing frequency combs and also for in general for a, for optimization of, of let's say ultra wideband systems. So in this case, we have an incoming signal has a very uneven power profile and frequency and we like to actually design a Raman amplifier that has an inverse gain profile. And the question is how to adjust the pump powers and the wavelengths such that the, at the output of the amplifier, we have this flat gain profile. This is actually the framework here. I mean, basically, I mean, for this machine learning framework, we have the design parameters X, and then we have the system, and then we have the performance of the system. And basically what we do, as already told you, okay, I'll skip this slide because I see I don't have so much time. Okay, I can just try to tell you a little bit about the evaluated scenario. So basically what we use this inverse system design is to design C-band amplifiers using both discrete and the distributed Raman amplifiers. And in this case, we had four pumps that we needed to optimize and the wavelengths of the pumps were fixed. So the three parameters were only pump powers. And basically what we, what we do in this experiment, we have an AC source, I mean, which covers the C-band. And then what we do is actually we vary the pump powers and then we record different spectra. And then from this, we do the learning of the system. I think this is, yeah. I can show it to you here. I think this is an important slide. So how actually to generate the data sets? So basically in this case, I mean, what we have is that we have the wavelengths and the pump powers. And then what we do is actually we adjust, we, we, we sample the wavelengths and a pump power from this uniform distribution where we specify certain ranges for the wavelengths and the pump powers, and then we record different data sets. And from these data sets, basically what we do is we represent it to our neural network to do the learning. So this is our data set. It consists of the wavelengths and of the gains. And from these data sets, we do the, the, the learning. Okay, this is... So if then we, what we do is actually we present the flat gain profiles as our target, and then we propagate it through an inverse network. And then we get the pump powers and the wavelengths. And then what we do is we propagate to our forward network. And then we compute the error between this target and the target we get. And then we use the gradient descent to actually do the update on it. And we can also design it for a tilted gains or an arbitrary gains. And then we apply these values actually to our Raman amplifier, and then we actually try to measure, I mean, how close we are to those target values. And as you can see, our, our design is, is relatively close to our flat profiles, to our tilted or arbiter gains. Now, one needs to make sure actually, when you design the flat gains, you need to actually make sure that your amplifier, Raman amplifier with those, those number of pumps is actually able to generate your flat gain profiles. That's why we always have a larger error for flat gain profiles than for arbitrary gains because those arbitrary gains are part of the of the data set. And the performance metric in this case is actually basically is the max error between your target gain and the design. And typically, I mean, this is a benchmark. And this, in case, and maybe I'm running out of time a bit here. So basically, our record result is actually for the C plus L band and S plus C plus L band, where we're actually able to design Raman amplifiers with very low error here. And this is the mean error and then the standard variation. And these are actually the gain profiles for C plus band distributed Raman amplifier and then for C plus S plus L band discrete Raman amplifier. And as you can see here, I mean, we are able to use this framework to design very flat gain profiles for this very broad band amplifier 
amplifiers and also for a, for a filtered Raman amplifiers. And if you look at the experiment, I mean, basically, this is I already mentioned to you how to generate the, the data sets. I mean, basically, what we do is, I mean, we have the AC source and then we have the Raman amplifier and then we actually sample different values of the pump parts and then record the spectra. And then we measure the gain and then we present to this to the, the Renara network. And basically, I mean, this is the part, the, the, the end of my first lecture, because I think now we have just 15 minutes for the questions. And tomorrow I will go a little bit into the more details of our second part, which is ultra wideband optical phase detection beyond the thermal noise limit. So I think we can open this talk for, for questions. Well, thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. Uh... Since there's no question from the, oh, okay, it's coming, that's, that's great. Uh, let's see, is the relation between wavelengths and pump power with gain for the profile uh, is injective? Uh, I mean, is there any profile that can be mapped to two different wave and pump power sets? Yes, th there is, and, and, and you need to look, and those cases need to be in, uh, somehow avoided. In some, but it's not that probable, I would say. I mean, it, it depends on, you need to really be careful. I mean, you avoid this actually by, by limiting your pump powers ranges and your wavelength ranges. But it's true, I mean, if, if you have this problem, then, then you will get an error. Okay, thank you. Um, while we're waiting for maybe another question, I would have one myself, uh, which is maybe stupid, but... Uh, uh, you let me know in a second. So you were talking at the beginning of the talk about like using like physics inference or knowing bits about the physical uh, response of the system to determine whether machine learning was useful or not, right? Here, yes. you're essentially using the Raman gain of a pump, right? That will be transferred and using multiple, pump, multiple pumping system. So that of course, it's not a trivial problem, but essentially, you always know somehow what is the gain response profile for a simple yeah, for a simple pump, right? Now, am I correct or not? Yes, but I mean, if you have many pumps or if you have like bidirectional pumping, then it becomes very challenging. Yes, no, no, that's part of the, the idea. But as you as you know the profile, can you somehow inject this into the the neural network somehow? Because somehow you're doing a convolution of the system, right? So if you already know the pump profile. Can you have this as a subset uh, to implement the convolution network or something along this line? Does it make any sense or is that something completely useless in your case? You, you see what I mean somehow? Yeah, but we, we are, I think what, what we are, here what we are trying to do is, is relationship between the pump powers and the wavelengths and the gain spectra. Right. So basically what, I mean, we don't so much care what is in between because that's, I mean, so what we try to do is just this in and out mapping. Yes. Yeah. What I mean is in your system, for instance, as a layer, right? The in out mapping is absolutely perfect, no worries, right? But you, you have no um, you have no guess about the response of the system itself, right? As it no. is. Everything is three parameters and you have a neural network. Is that correct? Yes. So if you consider, for instance, the uh, response of your uh, gain function, the Raman gain function, can you use a layer for that as a transfer function of your pump and the mapping? Do you see what I mean somehow? Not, yeah, I see, but I'm not sure how you would do it. I mean, it's, it would overcomplicate maybe a bit of a problem. I, I'm not sure if that's making things easier uh, or not, but somehow, you know, this kind of pattern detection in convol uh, convolutional uh, neural network, right? Looking to extract small patterns and re uh, reproducing it. I was wondering if that was an use at all, but I don't right. know. But I think yeah, it, it's a. I would need to think about it a bit. Huh. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Sergey. You wanted to? Yeah, I just want to follow uh, this darker statement, but uh, uh, he really doesn't care what how system solve it. It it, it's, it may be related to your uh, question, Benjamin. So, yes. but. Yes, uh, typical machine learning, I mean, well, uh, advantage of machine learning for some application is that you don't care how, how the system solve the problem. 
But you, you know that for uh, nonlinearity compensation, for instance, it was useful to use some knowledge of the physics. Yes. And, uh, and uh, actually in the lecture of Alan today, he demonstrated how some, <laughs> some understanding of the underlying physics can help to design system. So why don't you uh, use uh, known equations for Raman amplifiers? Yes, they are complex, but you, you're solving uh, inverse problem. But might be you can create some uh, neural network uh, which follow physics of these models and do it in a comparable way, at least. I don't know. No, but th that's a good point because th that's true. I mean, when you look at the split step Fourier propagation of the signal through the fiber, you have a linear layer and then you have a nonlinear layer, right? Cell phase modulation. And, you, and if you use this cell phase modulation as an activation function, you get very good results. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, you can do this actually. And that's, there, are some, there have been some papers on, on, on this topic. I mean, that's... Okay. So, but I think in, in Raman case, I don't know, we wouldn't, because... It, because it, you stick basically yes. with uh, back propagation in a sense, right? Or with uh, yes, some black you, box approach, so you I, you don't care about physics of, of the model. You, you right? care. I mean, you could care by saying, well, what should my activation function be, such that I I represent my my Raman equations in the best possible way. That's true. Anyway, just suggestion. No, no, but that's a very good thing because I mean, then you can look at them in yeah. How yes. Oh, basically, physics can be useful for yeah, yeah, of course, as yes. we learned today yes. and yesterday. So, uh, 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 Benjamin, I think there is a question in yeah, the... Yeah, there's a question for, from Egor Sedov. Uh, you want me to read it or is that easy? No, I see the, the question is, I mean... Okay. Do we still have to collect a lot of data to train Raman amplification parameters? Where we do for... Basically, I mean, you, you I mean, the, the training sets are not that big. I mean, maybe we have like 2,000 samples. So we have 2,000 inc incidents incidents for the, uh, sorry, samples in our data set. So the data sets are not that big. Of course, the more data you have, the better it is because at the end of the day, I mean, if you use your neural network as a, for in a regression type, it's like an interpolator. So the more data you have, the you, it, neural network is extremely good at interpolating and very bad at extrapolating. So you really need to be careful how you design your training set. You need to cover every all the possible, you know, in between all the corners there. There are a lot of tricks how to actually design this. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions. I would just have a very small one. So when you're looking at the spectra, right, um, for, the, uh, for the learning of the system, right, so you're retrieving the pump power and wavelengths, Mm -hmm. When you're analyzing the data, how many input do you use in your uh, network? So do you have a minimal resolution to, so that you can retrieve the, the exact uh, the flatness of the system? So the spectral resolution per se? I mean, yeah, we use around 40 points for C-band. Okay. I mean, so. but we have some other examples where we use more, many more. Okay, so it's really, so 2000 uh, data set with 40 points yes. and it's working so well. Okay. It's not very complicated. I mean, I think that the good thing about it is that it's actually quite simple and yeah. it works. That's pretty good. So that's a... Uh... Uh, since there's another question from Stefano Martina, uh, if I understood correctly, you use neural network to calculate an inverse function of F. I didn't understand why you use the autoencoder architecture. First replicate F, then F. Um, Inverse of F. Ah, okay. This is the reason because I mean your inverse network will give you mapping from Y to X, but there is an error in this mapping. And then actually to correct for this, you use this forward network with the gradient descent in the autoencoder structure. So I, I maybe it's it's easiest I, I show it here. So first we present our target value store inverse network. 
And then we obtain the input parameters, let's say the pumps. And then we propagate those pumps and then we compute actually what the target is. And if this target is very much different than you know, our target we have specified, then we can actually use this error to update the input parameters. Yeah, good with me. Uh, I guess uh, Stefano has his answer. Uh, I think this is good for now. Uh, there was another no one. more questions. What would be the long term stability? Uh, that was from the previous talk, uh, it was related to the uh, talk of okay. density. Um, but you can still answer if you know the answer. <laughs> we actually, you, I, I, we were very surprised about this experiment because we did this experiment where we were just, you know, varying pump powers and recording specs and building the model. And then after a couple of months, we went to the lab and rebuilt the setup and the model was still the same. So I think it's a very robust, I mean, we were even surprised. Is that, is that because it's dual polarization involved so much in this case? No, I think it's just single pro. I think it, it, I think this mapping is quite stable, I think. Maybe because we designed the experiment quite well, I don't know. All right, uh, well, that's good. Yes, that's really good to know. Uh, I guess this is it for question, I think. Um, well, if that's all, I would thank you very, very much for this presentation and the answer that was really instructive. Uh, I think this is now uh, a small coffee break or virtual coffee break at least. So I would thank all the previous speakers and I suggest we meet here again at uh, 4.25, uh, if that's okay with everybody. Yes, and, and uh, then for tomorrow I will give you a, I will go to my another lecture. I have one more lecture, right? Yes, uh, the lecture is tomorrow afternoon from three to four. Yes. Uh, good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank uh, you very much for the invitation. Yes. Okay. See you. Thank oh. you, Doc. Thank you. Bye.